Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third Talks on the Hill on the topic of La Peste. Talks on the Hill is normally an event that brings together the John Lyon School community and the Harrow on the Hill community. We are disappointed that we are not able to host you at the John Lyon School, but are delighted that you are joining us for this remote event. In a way, thanks to being online, we are able to host more of you and some of you from further afield. We even have one of our speakers who is talking to us all the way from Canada. We hope you enjoy this evening and over to you, Mr. Carr. Good evening. I'm Mr. Carr, teacher of chemistry here at the John Lyon School. Before we begin proceedings, I wanted to inform you that throughout this event, there is an option on the right hand side of your screen to submit questions. Time has been allocated at the end of each talk for your questions to be asked via my colleague, Mrs. Trafford. I would like now to invite Rehan Barty to introduce our first speaker. Good evening all. My name is Rayan Barty and I'm currently in the upper sixth studying maths, chemistry, biology alongside an EPQ. As one of the deputy head boys and academic scholars of John Lyons School, it is with great honour to introduce our main speaker for tonight, Professor Hugh Montgomery. Dr Montgomery is a professor of intensive care medicine at UCL. His current consultancy practice in, critical, in the critical care unit has put him face to face with COVID-19, where he has shared his experiences and thoughts with the likes of Channel 4 News and The Guardian. Not only this, he sits on the Council of the UK Intensive Care Society and currently chairs the National Emergency COVID Critical Care Committee. So therefore, who better to introduce us and educate us on the global pandemic? It is with great joy to welcome Professor Hugh Montgomery and his title of choice, the environment and COVID. Well, thank you very much indeed for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk with you. I normally would be giving you a talk on the molecular biology of COVID, its cellular interactions, the way in which it makes patients so very sick. But I've been asked to give you a slightly different talk this evening, and that is about the environmental and sociological factors that led us to where we are, and actually to raise the flag of warning about where we may be going next. So I've prepared some slides for you. So with a bit of luck, uh, we should be able to find them. There we go. And I'm hoping that you can see those. If not, I'm sure someone will shout. So here's the beast that's been affecting us. Uh, hopefully none of you, because you're all young and fit and healthy, but uh, we're seeing a lot of death and destruction from this now. Um, five or six deaths a day in the hospital I'm dealing with even now. And I'm going to give you a context to where this may have come from. So on our x-axis here, we have uh, the year up to the present date. And on the y-axis to the left, the population in billions. And you'll see that that population really didn't change very much until the agricultural and industrial revolutions. In fact, we reached the first billion people on the planet after 540 million years, a uh, billion years of, of, of multi-celled uh, life in 1804. We got another 123 added, uh, another 123 years later, we had another billion, but essentially we've been adding another billion to the planet every 12 to 14 years ever since. Now, if you look at the uh, global domestic product in trillions of dollars, and these are inflation adjusted for 1990, that's the right-hand side, y-axis, you'll see the shape of the curve is very much the same, um, except that post-industrial revolution, it was really in the 1950s that the world economy really took off in this way. But the difference, of course, is in scale. If we look at a global domestic product per capita in inflation-adjusted dollars, that's risen 61-fold since that first billion people appeared on the planet. And those dollars, there's many more, they're eight times more people the 61 times increase in uh, dollars per capita being spent is reflected in use of natural resources. And just to give you some examples, this is fish. The orange line there is population growth. Uh, the blue underscored uh, shaded area 
is fish consumption in total. And you see that, that greatly exceeds the rate of population growth. Now, 21 kilograms of fish being consumed per man, woman, child and baby on the planet every year. And that's not including bycatch or what gets sucked into uh, nuclear reactors and so forth for cooling. We see the same sort of thing for grain. The grey dotted line there is population growth. And again, grain use is going up faster than population growth is. So again, just as for fish, more and more people on the planet, but each of them consuming more and more. In this case, 286 kilograms of grain per man, woman, child and baby on the planet for all 8 billion of us. The same for animals. As we get richer, we want to eat more meat. Now, if you're poor, you need that protein but we're all uh, eating far more in the way of animal protein than we need to. And again, you'll see this colossal increase worldwide. Now 44 kilograms of red meat per man, woman, child and baby on the planet. It's gone up fivefold in just 50 years. And we're currently killing 65 billion farm animals a year for human consumption. And the same actually goes to environmental destruction for water. Um, this is the planet desiccated, so all the water in the atmosphere and the oceans, rivers and lakes dried out and represented there by the sphere, the larger sphere to the left hand side. You'll see that actually the total amount of water on the planet is very limited. You'll see the amount of fresh water or that that we can tap into in lakes and rivers is even smaller still. And yet we're draining 4000 cubic kilometres of that water for human use every year. Now, we're not even here talking about uh, pollution. Um, we're just talking about the environmental use and together that's leading to less life on the planet. And so this Living Planet Index published every four years by the Institute of Zoology and the Zoological Society of London has counted the number of vertebrates on the planet using relative indices going back to 1970 when that was an index of one, so 100 percent. So let's see how we've changed since then. Well, the total number of vertebrates on the planet is down by nearly 68% since 1970. And if you're interested, I was eight years old then. The number, the number of fish on the planet is down by a similar amount. Freshwater vertebrates, though, are down by 84%. And in some areas of the world, like Central and South America, we're down by 94%. Now, this is important because we're stripping out the total numbers of animals on the planet but we're also stripping out the complexity of those ecosystems too, because the extinction rates are high. We know that we're currently rendering around six, uh, eight animals extinct every single hour. So ecosystems are getting smaller, they're getting constrained as to where they are by planetary destruction from farming, for instance, cities, roads and so forth. And we're making those ecosystems less complicated too by killing off entire species within them. Looking at land use alone, the area of the Earth's surface currently used for commercial grazing is equivalent to the entire surface area of the whole of the continent of Africa. And it's because we're running out of areas to graze and grow crops that we're having to look elsewhere. So if you imagine we can't grow crops anymore where they're currently grown, we can't grow it where it's too high, too steep, too cold, too dry. We can't grow it on the Arctic because that's an ocean um, and we're running out of places for the crops, the people, the infrastructure and the animals. And that's why we're chopping down rainforests at this colossal rate. Now a soccer pitch every second worldwide of rainforest being destroyed. And if you look at those areas, the animals where you were chopping down those trees are being forced into ever smaller areas. And animals that shouldn't normally see one another are having to predate on one another and humans are ingressing into these areas when they never would have been there before. And this is a witch's brew, a lot of humanity in contact with animals they wouldn't normally meet, and those animals in contact with other animals they wouldn't ordinarily meet too. And just to give you an idea of how much we've stripped out those ecosystems, you'd have seen the report today showing that the total mass of all things man-made on the planet now exceeds the total mass of the entire living biosphere on the planet. Our farming practices have also become dangerous. 72% um, of the birds on the planet now are farmed poultry, and most of them are farmed in this sort of way. And you can see that this is basically a large petri dish. 
um, an infection in one bird will rapidly spread to others. But when you've got this mass incubator of billions of these sorts of animals all cattle together, um, it allows mutation in those viruses to take place. And the mutations in diseases spread can then hop from those animals to other animals such as us. And we see that and we'll come back to this in just a moment. It's not just chickens. Uh, this is farming of commercial mink. Uh, these farms in Denmark for fur. And people in Britain won't buy these anymore, but in China and Southeast Asia more broadly, um, mink farming um, is feeding uh, the demand for fur. Again, huge numbers of the animals kettled together, ease of transmission through those animal populations and then potentially to us. And this has caused us trouble before. So this is actually in Ghana. Um, but this is a wet meat market. And if you just look at the animals that's there, there's everything from bats, snakes, pangolins, um, dogs, all sorts of animals there. But in wet meat markets, there are also the live meat markets nearby where these live animals are kept together ready for slaughter. And you can see again animals that should never ever be near one another around the corner from this picture are being kept live in cages, one on top of the other, on top of the other with feces, fur, and feathers all mixing. And this led to our first spillover event, as it's known, of an, a virus crossing from animals to humans. Now, of course, we've seen them before. Bird flu and Spanish flu uh, are around the first war. Um, we've seen HIV, which came probably from a simian immunodeficiency virus. But in the last 17 years, we've had three such spillover events. This was the first, 2002, SARS-CoV-1 probably coming from horseshoe bats in a Chinese market and spreading via civets in the same market to cross over into humans. In 2012, we had MERS, which spread from dromedaries kept in large numbers close to human populations and dropped from dromedaries to humans. And then, of course, we have had SARS-CoV-2, which appeared first in 2019, spreading from bats, possibly through an intermediate of pangolins, but definitely onwards to man. And if we don't think that came from uh, a virology institute, then it certainly came from the kettling of these animals together. Now, these events are going to get more and more prevalent, not just because of the farming practices I've spoken about, not just because if you push huge numbers of, let's say, uh, mink or chickens together, that you allow viruses to spread fast and mutate quickly, and some of those will jump to humans, but also because of the deforestation and the extinctions of which I've spoken. These make outbreaks disease much more prevalent because you're getting for you're forcing animals together, you're forcing them to predate on each other when they wouldn't normally. You're putting humans directly into contact them as we ingress. Just remember that picture of Amazonian deforestation. And that allows these viruses to jump. Um, and as you deplete richness of ecosystems, as you many of you will know, nature abhors a vacuum. Other bugs will get in there and will expand to fill that gap, and then will jump to us as well. Kate Jones, one of my colleagues at UCL, wrote, put this in printed Nature a few weeks ago, saying we've been warning about this for decades and nobody paid us any attention. Well, I hope we're paying attention now because we've had three such spillover events now. That's not if you're including H1N1 bird flu at the beginning of the century. And of course, you've got to remember things like Ebola, which jumped to humans partly because there was a 500 fold increase in population density in the areas where those bats that carried the Ebola reservoir lived. Now, we've got plenty more potential for more of these events coming. There are at least 5,200 more coronaviruses out there, mostly in mammal populations. And it is certain that if we continue the way we're going, some of those will jump to humans. And some of them could be a lot more dangerous than the one that we've currently faced. And furthermore, there are a bunch of other brain viruses, for instance, um, such as the adenoviruses and the arboviruses out there in rainforests, which already are jumping into humans. Normally they're contained and haven't yet formed pandemics, but the viral encephalitides are already jumping, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, um, from animal populations to humans. So we sow the seeds with this sort of deforestation, but we then spread those seeds with air travel which is absolute lunacy too. If you go back to 1950, that not a single jet ticket was sown to the British public 
or to the public anywhere in the world because commercial jet planes weren't flying in 1950. But 70 years later, in the month before coronavirus struck us this time round, 142 people were boarding a jet plane every single second. So once you've grown this virus and allowed it to jump to humans, we've then got this tremendously large uh, dissemination um, system in the form of air travel and mass transport. So this was running in SARS-CoV-1. Um, within about six weeks, we had 8,000 infected, and you can see these air corridors transmitting. This was MERS, a much less contagious disease, quite fatal, but much less contagious, but again, spread uh, through air corridors. And this was the map. Um, actually, this was the map within six weeks of SARS-CoV-2 spreading, um, but we now, as you know, have reached well over 100 million people, and it's been spread um, by aeroplanes around the world, and then, for instance, in London on mass transport. We're making things worse with the farming practices we've spoken about. So if you think of those mink farms I spoke of, um, humans having got this from bats in China, spread it around the world. The humans then gave it to mink in the mink farms, which incubated it and created mass mutations, which then spread back to humans. And this cluster five was a very dangerous mutation, which was managed to be just able to be contained without spreading, unlike, of course, the other mutations we've now got. We should also think, though, just finally on the sociological issues of this, that we spread these viruses largely into very poor, densely packed populations, the favelas of Brazil on the left and African slums on the right. When you densely pack poor people together where they can't escape and because of poverty, they have to go to work in places where they might contract it. The poor are the worst affected. And that's the same even in Great Britain. The demographics of this disease in Britain, it's not to say there aren't wealthier people affected. And indeed, some of your relatives may have died of this disease. But predominantly, this has been a disease of poverty in Great Britain too. Because if you're poor, or particularly of a, um, of a minority ethnic population, you're often living with large numbers of people in your flat, extended families in your houses. You're having to go to work, you can't get furloughed. And often the jobs you're doing bring you into direct contact with people who are likely to be infected. And indeed, over 50 percent of the intensive care patients we're looking after in Britain come from the poorest two fifths of the population. And remember, too, that over 50 percent of the patients we're looking after are also obese or morbidly obese. And this is a disease, obesity, very largely also of poverty because highly energy dense foods are the cheapest to buy. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that um, we created this problem through the behaviours in farming practices, through deforestation, we're going to bring these further forwards and through ecosystem destruction, and by our hubris in thinking it's a good idea for everyone to hop on a plane to fly around to visit family members or go on holiday several times a year, or for business reasons. Um, this is mad. And if we continue to do this, um, the future doesn't look at all bright for us. Uh, uh, as we go forwards, we need to change now. Thank you. We are. Um, hello, good evening, I'm Mrs. Trafford, Maria Trafford. She's going to um, take questions from you. That was a fantastic talk from Hugh and a very poignant image you left us with of um, us sawing our own um, branch off. Um, which won't be funny. Um, so I wonder if we've got any questions about um, about where we are as humanity, what we are doing, our role in in the current state that we are in. Um, if you have any, then please do put them in. Um, there's a little bubble, two little bubbles that you can see at the top right hand side of your screens and one has a question mark in it. If you click on that, you can type a question and um, I can relay it to, to Hugh and hopefully disappear from your screens while we do that. That's fine. If obviously, if there are questions, others will be speaking and be very erudite afterwards, but if there are things medically that you'd like to know about, then I'll happily take questions on that too. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, because this is something that um, I talk about a lot with friends and family and um, we are concerned about where we can go with this. Do we have to make some major decisions like 
we are not going to do intensive farming. Therefore, we're going to we're going to go vegan. Mm. Or where 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 should the human race be going with this? Um, well, you, it in a nutshell, we have to make those radical decisions. We haven't got time left for incremental ones. And the drivers here of the SARS-CoV-2 spread are the same ones that are causing planetary destruction in the form, for instance, of climate change. I mean, bear in mind that deforestation of rainforests in the next three years will be responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than every single aeroplane flight ever taken from the days the Wright brothers or will be taken up to 2030. So a lot of what we're doing here is damaging, not just in terms of risking us from these uh, spillover infections, but threatens the survival of the human species in the generation of children who are listening to this talk now. Mm. And we've been in this game now for since the early 1990s, talking about the need for change. And the only change has happened as things have got worse and we've run out of time now. So in answer to your question, yes, we need to make changes, but you're absolutely right. They need to be radical changes now. We haven't got time for slow incremental ones. So you might have actually answered um, Toby Cope's question um, there. He's asking if there is any way to reverse the current situation. So potentially we could halt it. Can we reverse? Um, not easily, in honesty. I mean, we can cut off the supply line. So by not flying and not spreading, if something happens next time round, we won't spread it so rap rapidly. We can change farming practices, but and we can change um, ecosystem degradation, but we can't get countries to agree on this. So the uh, COP process, the Conference of Parties and Negotiations since on climate change, COP26 is this year in Glasgow, yeah. um, which tells you there have been 25 of these meetings before and they haven't delivered a single, you know, a single molecule of carbon dioxide reduction in emissions. And in fact, in the scale of change we have with SARS-CoV-2, we're down about 7% in emissions this year, even with the mass industrial uh, drop off in production and so forth and transport we've had this year. So it won't be possible, I don't think, to reverse it. I think we can slow things down substantially, but we haven't got very long left to do it in. We're, we're tripping, certainly on the climate side, we're uh, triggering um, positive feedback loops at a really dangerous rate now. We're already looking at a conservative estimate of three quarters of a billion people migrating um, from coastal areas, perhaps in the next 60 years. Um, and you've just got to think if you move that number of people from a resource poor area into another, the conflicts that are going to result. So this is going to be very, very ugly uh, unless we mm -hmm. take very quickly indeed, I'm afraid to say. Um, and the focus sadly has been on SARS-CoV-2. If we'd spent the same amount of money that we've spent on SARS-CoV-2 around the world, we'd have cured the climate crisis already, but we didn't. Okay, that's a very sobering um, thought for us actually, and, and one that should be published out there somewhere. Um, we've got one more question. I think it's really interesting from an anonymous questioner, but I will take it, um, even though they've not put their name. Um, we're wondering how well you think the government has handled the pandemic. That is a lot, rather loaded question, but you're such an interesting person. Um, well, OK, so I give you my personal view, yeah. uh, not, uh, not the professional organisations with whom I work. Um, I think it's been appallingly managed and I think it's we're not alone in having done that. The WHO playbook for pandemics was quite clear. You lock down hard, you lock down early, then you work out what to do and you release based on the evidence you've got. Um, we didn't do that. You then communicate clearly with the public about the nature of the problem and tell them what to do, which and that wasn't done either. You then set in regulations and you mandate them and enforce them. And we didn't do that either. We advised people what we'd like them to do, like wearing masks and social distancing, and we didn't do anything about that. You quarantine the people that might be bringing the virus in. We didn't do that either. You track, test and trace so that you can extinguish the brush fires when they start, and we still haven't done that. If you look at the countries that have, uh, Australia got it wrong to start with and got absolutely hammered. They then switched tack and followed what other Southeast Asian countries had done and basically life in Australia is back to normal. They've locked down now quickly with a single case in one Australian city in the last two days. They'll extinguish that outbreak and they'll be back to normal. New Zealand has had 26 deaths in an entire year. Vietnam has had seven people on an intensive care 
um, in the entire year. And the same applies to Korea. It applies to what's happened in China. Um, so it didn't need to be like this um, in short. And whether that's the problem with the government or whether it's a problem with the way British people behave in response to authority, I don't know. But I am I'm on record of having said this and I stand by it that um, there have been people, the phrase I used was blood on their hands. And those people who continue to aggregate together in close proximity because they think they're immune or it doesn't matter because they're young, uh, they're not socially distancing, they're not wearing masks, they are spreading this disease and the attack rate is between 42 and 82 percent in confined spaces. It won't be then that dies, but someone will as a result of it. So uh, in equal measure, I think um, we all have to look at our own behaviours. But no, I don't think the British government's handled this well. OK, thank you so much. We're getting so many questions coming in. Um, lots of them are sort of overlapping and you've answered some of them in, in answering other questions, but I'll publish as many as I can um, and you could have a little look at them later. But thank you so much, um, Hugh. That's amazing that you've um, given us your time and it's been thoroughly interesting. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to hand over now to um, one of our students, Vinnie Kapoor in Lower Six, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Over to you, Vinnie. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mom. Um, as Mom said, I'm Vinnie Kapoor, a Lower Six student here at John Lyon. Um, I study English, Spanish and politics and an EPQ. And tonight I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, who's uh, Dr Laurie Jones. So Dr. Jones is a medical historian at the University of Ottawa um, and Carleton University as well in Ottawa. Uh, her main area of expertise is medical writing about the plague. And she's also known for her work on detecting images from the past that have been wrongly labeled as showing plague and the Black Death. Uh, Dr. Jones works with historians and scientists to better understand how plague moved across time and space. And the audience tonight might wonder how pandemics spread in the past despite rapid transportation not existing like today. And Dr. Jones will talk about how um, pandemics of plagues got their start and what kept them um, going for centuries at a time. And joining us all the way from Canada, it's my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Jones, Dr. Laurie Jones. Thank you very much to Dr. Weinberg for inviting me to talk with you this evening about plague pandemics from a historian's perspective. Just a year ago, the thought of a pandemic like the Black Death might have seen on almost impossible in our 21st century Western world. The idea that a tiny micro organized, sorry, tiny microorganism could disrupt our lives for so long and cause so many deaths worldwide in such a short period of time is not likely something that we ever really considered. Masks, lockdowns, social distancing, empty streets, mass graves, and a new disease with no cure all of these are things that before early 2020 were outside our realm of understanding. Yet our experience with COVID is not entirely novel. Plague pandemics of the past also seem to be uncharted territory for our ancestors. And I believe that looking at previous plague pandemics can help us put our current experience with COVID into a broader historical context. And at the same time, our experiences today can help us to better imagine what it must have been like living through historical pandemics. I'd like to start by sharing a short story to give you a sense of plague's long-term impact on humankind. In a mass grave in the Afanisivia Gora region of Southern Siberia, near the border with Mongolia, lie the skeletal remains of three young women. They died about 5,000 years ago with a deadly bacterium in their bodies, what we now call Yersinia pestis. About a thousand years later, still in Siberia, another mass grave holds the remains of three young people, including a mother and her young child. Two and a half thousand years after that, in the early 540s, a pandemic generated by a different strain of the same bacteria spread across the world that had just seen the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Its victims included a woman with a small child still held tightly in her arms, both buried carelessly in another mass grave in Cambridgeshire, about 50 to 60 miles from where you are right now. Some 800 years later, 
during what we call the Black Death, English Princess Joan was on her way to be married in Castile. She was stricken down by plague during a stop in Bordeaux. In 2004, 5,000 years after the mass grave in Siberia, yet another strain of the same bacterial organism was found in a 10-year-old girl in Arua, Uganda. She lies buried alone. In 2014, a woman living in Peru fell victim to a different strain. Then, in 2015, in New Mexico, four middle-aged women became infected with the same bacterium. Two of them died. In September 2017, in Madagascar, the death of a 47-year-old woman uncovered a growing plague epidemic on that island that ultimately caused the death of more than 200 people. Sadly, the disease has now become an endemic reality there. The lives and deaths of all of these women from different parts of the world and across a span of more than 5,000 years are all linked by a single biological pathogen, the Yersinia pestis bacterium. Bacteria have their own evolutionary lineages, very much like a human family tree. In the genetic sciences, this is known as the phylogenetics tree. And I I know that the tree on the screen looks daunting, but what it shows you is that each of the colored squares, circles, triangles, and stars are individual strains of the Yersinia pestis bacterium. The ones that are the same shape and color are the most closely related, but in reality, they're all very similar, and only tiny differences distinguish one from another. Think of it as your great-great-grandparents having really strong genes so that subsequent generations of cousins are still genetically very much alike. This phylogenetic tree offers historians and scientists some important information. First is that the plague bacteria from many hundreds of years ago is very similar to plague bacteria today. It hasn't changed that much at all. Secondly, the tiny differences that we can find in the various strains are actually very important because when scientists recover ancient Yersinia pestis DNA from the skeletons of plague victims, these differences in the genetic strains let us know which outbreaks are linked together, even far into the past. And this can help us to discover the route that plague took as it was transported from one place to another. It can also help us to discover when the bacterium had time to modify itself to adapt to a new living environment. The Yersinia pestis bacterium only occasionally crosses paths with humans. Its natural hosts are ground burrowing rodents, such as marmots, rats, gerbils, chipmunks, prairie dogs, and ground squirrels. It's typically spread by fleas. What we historians and scientists are working to understand now is what conditions cause Yersinia pestis to spread and survive across environments and timelines as different and as distant as the one in which the female victims I mentioned earlier lived. The short answer is a blend of three things ecological change, human contact with wild animals, and a level of historical human interconnectivity that we perhaps never realized before. I'll come back to those points momentarily. First of all, I want to talk about the three recorded plague pandemics that we know of. I should mention that there are very likely were other major pandemics in the past that we just don't know enough about yet. We have a few skeletons, like our women from ancient Siberia, but not enough to tell even the beginning of their story. We definitely don't have enough written evidence or other historical records. And that's the main reason why historians talk about three recorded plague pandemics. But we need to be careful because our thinking about the three pandemics, including where they began, when they ended, and who was affected by them, has largely been influenced by the work of historians in Europe and North America. Stories and evidence from other parts of the world are only now starting to be included, and they're broadening what we now know about these pandemics. The first plague pandemic is often called the Plague of Justinian because it began during the reign of the Byzantine Emperor Justinian. Records of its first appearance in the, in the Egyptian port of Pelusium do not mean, though, that this was actually the starting point in a historical or scientific way. In fact, because none of the natural animal hosts of Yersinia pestis were native to Pelusium, the plague had to have come into the city from some other place where it wasn't being recorded. For example, there's very little written evidence of any kind from ancient Ethiopia, but it's now believed that plague was one of the factors that brought about the collapse of the Aksumite Empire. 
this helps us historians to remember that just because something wasn't written down, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. To come back to the plague of Justinian, over the course of about a year, plague spread outward from Pelusium, indicated by the red starburst in the bottom right of the slide. It went east to the Levant, which includes modern day Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, and then also west to the larger Egyptian port of Alexandria. From there, it moved along the North African coast and across the Mediterranean to Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. It continued to spread into Europe and the rest of the Middle East, following trade routes, armies, and other movements of people. By about the year 544, it had reached England and Ireland. Even after the first wave of epidemics ended, local outbreaks kept occurring sporadically over the next 200 years. Then, it seems, all went quiet for about eight centuries, at least in Europe. In 1348, Italians began recording huge spikes in deaths from a new mysterious disease. Some of these records blamed it on the Mongols, claiming that they had thrown dead bodies over the walls of, of Kaffa, a Genoese trading post on the Black Sea. As sailors fled the besieged city and returned to Italy, they brought the plague with them. Although we now know that the story about Kaffa isn't true, the Mongols did indeed carry plague into the Black Sea region as they expanded their empire. New research suggests that as they moved, the Mongols disrupted colonies of marmots and other rodents in Central Asia as they looked for food and for skins. They then seemed to have carried plague in their grain supplies as they moved west, besieging cities one after the other. Records from cities in Iran and Iraq, for example, show that major disease outbreaks happened once the sieges were lifted and grain supplies were brought in. We can be sure that rodents and their fleas and the plague came in with the grain. Once it reached Europe, plague seems to have exploded. It hit a population weakened from decades, decades of famines, warfare, economic depression, and urban crowding. It ultimately killed somewhere between 40 and 60% of the population in just a few short years. New outbreaks occurred every decade or so in the 14th century, each time killing another 5 to 10% of the population in the places that it hit. Throughout the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, plague outbreaks became an almost regular fact of life throughout Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, and we now know Sub-Saharan Africa. By the early 18th century, it seems to have subsided in Western Europe, but continued to cause widespread havoc elsewhere well into the 19th century. In the 1850s, plague erupted yet again in China's Yunnan province, following a rapid and large influx of people into a rodent-infected area. It spread throughout China via trading activities and warfare. This third pandemic then spread from Hong Kong at the end of the 19th century across the world closely networked by steamships used for transporting goods, troops, and leisure travelers. Plague devastated China and India in particular, causing more than 10 million deaths in India alone. It also reached the Americas for the first time. Cases of and deaths from plague still continue every single year in those parts of the world where it has now become endemic, including the southwestern United States. As I mentioned earlier, Madagascar recently experienced a deadly and significant outbreak, and so the third pandemic is not really over. We might wonder how these plague pandemics spread in the past when rapid transportation didn't exist and what kept them going for so long. The answer to the first part of the question is simply human movement and human interconnectedness. People might not have moved from place to place as quickly as they do now, but they did move around a lot. Trade, warfare, visiting, pilgrimage, migration, all of these happened in the past just as they do now. And where people moved, and especially when they carried food and textiles with them, rodents and their fleas moved too. And when people became sick with the mnemonic rather than the bubonic version of plague, they were able to spread the disease even faster just by coughing. The answer to the second question, what kept plague pandemics going for so long, comes back to what I mentioned earlier about the many different strains of the disease. Each strain represents the plague bacterium adapting to a new environment, such as a new rodent species, for example. 
Everywhere the plague bacterium was carried, it had to find a new rodent species to live in. And it did so, and as, as it did so, sorry, it became endemic, meaning that it settled into its new home as though it meant to stay there long term. Every time a new outbreak happened, it was probably because one of these new rodent homesteads was somehow disrupted. I'd like to wrap up by thinking about what links we can make between plague pandemics and our own current pandemic today. One is the ecological disruption that plays a role in bringing them about in the first place. The first and second plague pandemics have both been linked to climate change. The first was caused by the after effects of major volcanic eruptions, and the second by the unstable transition from a warm period to a little ice age. These changes affected not only agricultural production and food supply, but also the natural habitats of plague carrying rodents. And in both cases, the unintended outcome of human incursion into wild animal habitats was that an animal disease temporarily became a human disease. Another link is the inter interconnected of us as a human species. Once an infectious disease becomes a human ailment, it has the ability to spread far and quickly simply because we move, we interact, and we are in physical contact with each other. Third is the wide range of intertwined medical, astrological, and religious approaches used to explain and manage the pandemics. Just as we see now, fake news and quack remedies circulated in the past alongside information and solutions that fit comfortably within traditionally accepted guidelines. For me as a historian, one of the most enduring images from early last year as COVID started to wreak havoc was that communities stopped counting their dead. In Northern Italy, one town cemetery was so overwhelmed with coffins that military trucks had to take them to neighboring provinces for burial. Bodies were being left in the streets in Ecuador. In New York, they were piled in mass graves. This is the first time in our living memory that we're collectively experiencing a truly global pandemic. Yet from a historical perspective, little is really unique about our pandemic. Like most pandemics of the past, ours has proven to be especially deadly to the old and the vulnerable. It has tested the boundaries of our medical, scientific, and religious thought, and it has raised the specter of scapegoating. Reactions to our pandemic also have their echoes in history. Narratives of past pandemics tell of cities deserted through self-isolation, of social distancing heartily practiced and harshly enforced, of hoarding, and of the spread of fake news and fake cures. Despite, despite some horrific losses, though, survivors of past pandemics embraced life again and rebuilt what had been lost. The questions facing all of us now is what kind of world will we construct post-pandemic and what will future historians learn from our experience? Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. That's um, fascinating, actually. Um, thank you. And um, We've got a few questions coming in for you here, so I'll go straight to them. Um, we have. Um, OK, I'll read the question out to you. Um, it's asking you which um, this is really fascinating, which group of people in history best dealt with the plague through the years? And there's an understanding that the Arabs dealt with it well around 1400 years ago, where isolation and quarantine was affected by um, local heroes to uh, heroes, sorry, healers to prevent the spread. But um, in your, your opinion, is there a, a people group in particular or or a plague in particular that was managed well? That's a it's actually a fascinating question because and part of the problem is that even within an inv individual town or society, different people reacted differently. So some people accepted advice to to protect themselves, even to wear masks, for example, to stay away from other people. But yet that their neighbors decided to have end of life parties and celebrate, you know, what might be coming to them as the end of the world. Um, we know that quarantine measures were implemented starting in Italy um, and Croatia very early on. Whether they actually did any good or not is unlikely because if plague is being spread by rodents and their fleas and the quarantines were meant to prevent people from interacting, the rodents, for example, could still spread into town and, and take people out that way. Um, 
I think it's really the really the people who did the best were the ones who learned about hygiene measures and protecting themselves and trying to stay clean, trying to stay healthy. Um, but in terms of identifying a specific population group, I, I don't think that there is one. OK, thank you for that one. Now I'm recognising a member of our biology staff here, Neville Boney is asking, um, he's saying it strikes me that diminished population health plays a significant role in the spread of plagues. What exiting gaps in our healthcare systems should governments focus on for the future? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question that well. Have I misread it? No, I, I actually I think I can address that. It's great. The, the issue, so the, one of the big questions that has been looked at recently is if plague was already circulating um, before the Black Death, for example, why did it explode the way that it did and why did up to 60% of the population die? And archaeologists are now demonstrating that most of the people who died had underlying health conditions. And so we're seeing exactly the same thing now with the COVID pandemic that the people who are most likely to sicken and die are people with underlying health conditions and so as a population we need to look at how do we make ourselves healthier because by being generally more healthy and having stronger immune systems that's really the only way to prevent these things from taking a hold in ourselves and you know taking taking the lives of so many people. Yeah, that's re a really good point. And um, following on from that, uh, a question, um, if you could look into your crystal ball, judging by historical evidence, um, how much longer do you think our current pandemic will last? Well, if we are using historical pandemics as an example, um, I would say each each round, each epidemic outbreak, localized out epidemic outbreak usually lasted for about two years and then was brought under control, but then came back again. So every 10 years, every 20 years or so, it tended to come back because people started to let their guard down and went back to the way that they had been living before. So uh, with a vaccine, I think we are in a better place to bring an end to this one, but I don't think that I don't think the virus itself is going away. I think it is now part of our world and we need to learn how to live with it safely. OK, thank thank you so much, Laurie. That's been really fascinating. We do have a few more questions in the sidebar for people to enjoy, but we're, we're going to stick to our time. So apologies. I know people would love to talk to you a bit more, um, but thank you so much for your talk. And um, again, really, um, Super to hear and his, from an historian's point of view. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over now to our um, own Josh Carr, who will be introducing our next speaker. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is the Reverend Andrew Hammond, chaplain of St John's College, Cambridge. His talk is titled Plagues as God's Punishment, where he'll be talking about plagues in the Bible and modern Christian interpretations. The Reverend himself is responsible for the pastoral care for students, staff and fellows at his college. Previously, he was the chaplain at King's College, Cambridge and was the Sixth Centre at St Paul's Cathedral in London. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Reverend Andrew Hammond. Hello, uh, it's great to be with you. And uh, this is a bit of a body swerve in the uh, gathering, I know, suddenly going into theology. Um, I hope I'm not going to deliver a sermon, although there might be a little Jesus moment at the end, so brace yourselves for that. Um, when I was at St Paul's, one of the things I organised was this wonderful jamboree of John Lyons and all the associated schools, all the Harrow schools, including the Asian ones. So it's nice to be back, uh, as it were, at home base with you. Um, so here are two texts, here are two verses. From the Bible. So the plague was stopped among the people of Israel. Nevertheless, those that died by the plague were 24,000. That's from the Old Testament. And then from the New, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 
as they used to say when I was at school, compare and contrast. Uh, if you do a word search on plague in the Bible, you'll find 71 references. The most eye-catching and indeed eye-watering examples are the 10 plagues of Egypt. These are the plagues visited upon Egypt by God to persuade Pharaoh to free the Israelites from their slavery and let them leave. It took 10 and in order they are these, water turned to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, diseased livestock, boils, thunder and hail, locusts, darkness. And finally, uh, by far the worst of them all, the death of all firstborn children. So like Donald Trump, Pharaoh seemed impervious to reality. But unlike Donald Trump, he did finally get it. There are other plagues in the Old Testament, including that one that I just quoted. And that was one of several where God punishes his own people for idolatry or disobedience. And then there's this great leapfrog through the Bible right to the end, the very last book, the Revelation of St. John, otherwise known as the Apocalypse. And there we read of seven plagues poured out on the earth by seven angels who are agents of the wrath of God. There are certain sorts of Christian who believe both the historical accuracy of the 10 plagues of Egypt and the literal accuracy of Revelation as a prediction of what awaits us. This is a minority view, especially in the West, although it does, it does have some very vocal enthusiasts in the US. Most other Christians, and certainly all reputable Bible scholars, take the view that such fundamentalist literalism fundamentally misunderstands the kind of writing here. The plagues of Egypt, indeed the whole story of Moses and the Exodus and the 40 years in the wilderness, they're part of the Jewish people's foundational myths. They speak in richly fabulous style, literally fabulous style, of how they came to be God's chosen people in a land set apart for them by God. They know they're chosen. They know it's their land and then they tell stories to articulate those convictions. And then the book Revelation, which is not just the last in the Bible, but it's the last book that the church admitted into the official canon of scripture. It was a real argument. Uh, it's a uniquely extraordinary example of what we call apocalyptic writing. It's poetry born out of visions and dreams of the end times. How will all things come to an end? The believer might ask, to which the apocalyptic visionary might say, well, we have literally no idea, but I've had this crazy dream and it tells us some really important stuff about the power of God and how we should be living our lives. In the same way that the psychologist Jung could extract revelatory truths from dreams. So the church can extract revelatory insights from the dreams in the book revelation so that's just clearing the ground really what we've got left and that's really what i'm talking about today uh, is the residual but not at all inconsequential idea that when terrible things happen in this case plagues they've been visited upon us by god now this is clearly the belief throughout the old testament and remember that the old testament is a collection of writings not a book it's a collection of writings assembled and edited and re-edited over a, more than a millennium. But there you see, not just in those foundational myths, but in later stories, the patriarchs, the prophets talk unambiguously in these terms. Bad things are visited upon us. You get it in the Psalms, you get it in the books of the prophets. But in the New Testament, apart from that book, Revelation, this idea that terrible things like plagues or divine punishment rarely surface, I mean virtually never, in the New Testament. Jesus only mentions plagues once as one of the terrible things that will characterize and make recognizable the end times, the end of days. Here he is, like the book of Revelation, suddenly in apocalyptic mode. He's speaking in a poetic genre, which his hearers would have recognized. It's a bit like if you're <clears throat> with a bunch of people in a coastal pub and one of the locals starts singing a song that everyone recognizes or at least recognizes the style of the register shifts in the gospel stories jesus only sings this song the once 
And even when he does, when he's in that vein, Jesus does not say that the plagues are God's doing. And indeed, in another story, this is in Luke's gospel, uh, he rejects the idea that some people on whom a tower fell were any more sinful than anyone else. But the idea persists to this day. When I was first living in London in the 1980s, <clears throat> the time of this um, amazing series on the moment, it's a sin. There was a poster outside a church just next to the National Portrait Gallery, which just said in huge bold caps, AIDS is God's punishment on homosexuals. Now, what's so odd about Christians saying this sort of stuff is that Jesus himself spectacularly did not. He could be fierce, he could be pretty fierce about uh, bad behavior and its consequences, but he just doesn't seem to have this idea of a vengeful, angry God. So why does it persist? Well, there are lots of ways into this, far too many just for a little talk like this, but here's one. It starts with a conversation I had years ago with a wise old abbot in a monastery where I was staying on retreat. It was before I was ordained. I'd booked my half hour. You had to book in because he was in demand. And the thing that I wanted to talk about, the thing that was bugging me, was all the Old Testament language about wrath, God's wrath. And in that way that wise old holy people have, he just sort of nodded sagely and then he looked at me and he said, oh, it's just a human way of talking. It's just a human way of talking. And of course it is. The creation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, was that millennium long struggle to understand God and talk about him in human language because it's all we've got. And so if you start to think about God as a patriarchal father figure, you might start to project some patriarchal father characteristics on him, including him getting mad when you don't do what he wants. <clears throat> the idea that God is going to get mad if you don't do what he wants is actually more interesting in the Old Testament than in many other ancient religions. It's developed away from that primitive notion of just placating a capricious God to prevent terrible things, disease, bad weather. But it is related. There's a kind of hardwired pagan religiosity in our psyche, which thinks that misfortune is visited upon us if we let it. And we need to please the God to prevent it. It's hardwired in and lots of people still think it. Now in the Old Testament, context already. The God of Israel is not capricious, like the God of the Aztecs. What he wants is a certain kind of holy living, but for the people themselves, the fear of punishment, the desire to placate is much the same. And so you have the people of Israel going round and round in this cycle of bad behavior and penitential sacrifice, like on a kind of inescapable loop. Uh, but then God breaks in. This is the Christian understanding of this. God breaks into that cycle in the person of Jesus. It's like the biggest reset of human living from our perspective. Now, so radical was that, um, and it had to be done within the culture of the time, uh, that Christians are still trying to work it all out uh, 2,000 years later. And uh, at the Last Supper, the night before he died, Jesus did say that when he was gone from them, the Holy Spirit would come and lead them into all truth. It really is still work in progress because some things are really hard to shift. That's why it's taken us so long and it's still work in progress, so long to work out the sinfulness of slavery and sexism and homophobia and the death penalty. Some of that primitive hard wiring is like spiritual knotweed. It's very hard to shift. But I think the Christian perspective is that Jesus came to change all that. In him, God reveals himself to be the God of love, not the God of plagues. Thank you, Andrew. Um, again, another fascinating talk and lots to think about there from scripture. And we've got a provocative question to start off and, and I'll ask it. 
Um, our questioner has asked, um, I can't quite remember how he put it, but what your thoughts were on um, religion as being like a plague. I think it was put in the 20th century as the opiate of the people um, that's used to make everybody think as one. So a rather provocative question, but I thought you would want to answer it. So I've asked it. Mm. Um. Well, I suppose I'd want to say that religion at its best is um, as a plague that you want to catch um, and hope that it spreads as far as possible. No, I, I mean, the opiate of the people thing is 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 powerful, isn't it? Because what it's talking about power it's talking about the use of religion and religious affiliation and religious practice to subdue a people to act as a kind of narcotic and make them incapable of uh, independent thought. But I think part of the process of understanding, certainly within the Christian tradition, of what it is Jesus was actually about, is getting away from all of that. So that uh, it's it's about the giving of health and freedom to be the people we're supposed to be. But we're still working it out. But you know, any any example of religious practice or affiliation which seems to have, you know, that those qualities of diminishment and uh, injury are wrong. So in that sense, it's it should definitely not be plague in the sense that we normally understand it. Thank you. Um, a, a tricky question that you've managed to answer very succinctly. Um, <laughs> the the next question is <laughs> the, the next question is really really interesting as well. Since the um, start of the current pandemic. Have you seen people turning or returning to the church? And how do you preach about the pandemic? So maybe the, the first part of that question, if you would, um, have you seen um, larger flocks? Um, I think that would be an exaggeration, but then I'm I'm working in a very, very specific small environment. I mean, the whole of my flock, so to speak, is 900 students. Um, <clears throat> but uh, certainly, you know, with the, the, all the stuff we've been doing online has clearly had a wider reach than, say, people who would would come to chapel. Um, I think what I've seen is that it has provoked people, and particularly more recently, actually. I mean, even since Christmas, things have just become a lot harder. There's a great deal more anxiety around. Um, people were sort of managing to grit their teeth before, and it's just now getting too much. And so now I'm hearing people um, who, because of uh, the pressures of, of living in the situations that they're in, whether they're here or at home, um, is making them think about bigger things. So uh, now sort of on an almost daily basis, I'm getting people who are having to think about what I would call like the, the macro. So there are any number of individual things um, which uh, are problematic or troublesome or worrying, but actually it's set, it's, it's they're feeding um, a more general sense of anxiety and foreboding. So, and sometimes uh, that means that people uh, ask me, they're talking to me rather than say the counsellor or the nurse or their tutor because there is a spiritual aspect to it. Um, sometimes that's the case, sometimes not. Uh, but my my context is too small and too specific to say that there's been a kind of mass in rush of people. Um, I think in the wider church, there's been a quite interesting kind of diff you know, different levels of engagement by people uh, being involved in online stuff. Yeah. Sure, and um, we're seeing, you know, a massive rise in mental health issues in this country, and especially amongst young people, which of course is very close to to our work. Mm -hmm. um, and this question is quite interesting. On the back of that, do you think the current pandemic would have been better dealt with by a more religious society, perhaps? You know, even in some cultures that we have today, which are more accepting of death because it, it's a more common occurrence. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So my question is asking you, are we, are we ill-equipped Ill to deal with the pandemic psychologically? Would it be better if we were believers? I wouldn't want to claim that, um, mm. partly because all the different ways in which people have a religious faith are so various. Um, that it, you know, you can't say one thing, but I think um, that I certainly see quite a lot of people who struggle to uh, cope with worry and anxiety 
um, because of the way in which they have been, uh, shall we say, prepared for the beginnings of adult life. All, that's a complex sort of portmanteau thing to say. Um, I would hope that, uh, certainly speaking for Christianity, the way in which actual Christian people in specific places, which is how the Church of England works, you know, in its parish system, um, simply being there for people and uh, responding uh, is is good in itself. It's 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 kind of low level, active kindness, and it's very good uh, because quite a lot's been said about the kind of you know the in in the response to the situation. There's been this massive increase in active kindness not just philanthropy but people getting out there and doing stuff um i wouldn't want arrogantly to claim that's got anything to do with religious impulses i i think um human beings have the capacity for kindness and uh, altruism and that this has brought it out of them and this is one of one of the better hard wirings in the human psyche um to which uh, christianity probably understood response but I, yeah i'd be very hesitant to to say that we we somehow could have been better prepared we certainly could be better prepared but it's not to do with it's not to do with a, a religious outlook being missing absolutely thank you for that um we've actually come to the end of your question time as well which is rather a shame there are some really big eschatological questions there Not for bad. you on on are we in the end times etc so um maybe you'll have a chance to answer those um personally i, I published them um and but thank you so much andrew and it's been very very interesting thank you um i am now going to hand over to alpha who is another one of our deputy heads to introduce our final speaker thanks alpha um, good evening, everyone. My name is Alpha Kalaja and I'm Deputy Head Boy as well. And I'm glad to, be in to introduce Dan Wong, our current Head Boy, as our final speaker of what has been a really entertaining evening. Um, having worked with him closely over this past academic year, um, I've seen his enthusiasm and his ability to engage a crowd um, firsthand. And so I'm really looking forward to listening to his talk. And it's titled La Peste, The Prophetic Tale of a Post-War Pandemic. Thank you, uh, Alpha. I, I hope you haven't hyped me up too much uh, and uh, I, I live up to the expectation that you've uh, now placed possibly upon me. So, yes, as Alpha said, uh, I'm going to be talking about the novel La Peste by Albert Camus, um, which was written in 1947 and sold relatively well uh, up until March uh, 2020, which obviously coincided with the first lockdown. And certain bookstores, I think Waterstones, for example, uh, saw sales triple com in comparison to a normal month. So people suddenly started flocking to this novel um, because of the way in which it was, it was just so similar to what we were experiencing. Um, and before I start, I think it's, it's important to talk a little bit about who Albert Camus was. Uh, he was born in 1913 in a town called Mondovi uh, in French Algeria. Uh, he was the descendant of uh, French, uh, native French uh, men and women. Uh, and that gave him and his family a, a reputation as what they called uh, pieds noirs, or literally hard shoes. This was because the, the French people were able to afford these hard black shoes, which the Algerians couldn't, and therefore they were seen as these aristocratic figures who were able to, to afford all these things that the natives couldn't uh, when they invaded and annexed Algeria. That was one of uh, a number of personal struggles he had. He lost his father uh, before he was born, actually, and he suffered from uh, tuberculosis at the age of 17, which ended quite a promising footballing career. But he moved on from that. He moved to Paris, uh, unfortunately, a few months before it was invaded by uh, Adolf Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany. He wanted to fight in the French resistance, but unfortunately was unable to because of his 
previous tuberculosis afflictions. So what he did instead was he turned his hand to writing. He wrote for a French resistance newspaper called uh, Combat. And this uh, writing after the war kind of propelled him into the spotlight, at which point he wrote uh, a number of novels, uh, for example, L'Etranger, uh, which is a, a very famous uh, French existential novel, uh, but also La Peste. Um, now, La Peste was set in Algeria, in a town called Oran, in 1947, which was the, the same year it was written. And it talks about the outbreak of the uh, bubonic plague in uh, Oran. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the bubonic plague uh, is typified by high fever, um, buboes, which are these sort of pustules uh, that cover the body, uh, especially near lymph nodes, and uh, swelling. And it's, it's transmitted, as Dr. Jones was mentioning earlier, through fleas. Um, and in some extreme cases, the inhalation of infected respiratory droplets, as uh, the WHO puts it. Now, this might sound familiar because uh, the idea of uh, inhalation of respiratory droplets is the same terminology that WHO uses for COVID-19. Um, so a little bit more about the novel. It follows the, the story of the people of the town uh, when uh, it's put into a, a quarantine or as we'd call it now, lockdown. Um, and it follows the lives of not only the, the spiritual and political leaders of the town, but also the key workers, as we call them, the doctors uh, and the medical staff, and also the, the normal everyday people. Now, I've put relevance to Camus' life on my slide, as you can probably see. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a red herring because he never actually experienced living in a, a plague town. Uh, there were plagues in Oran, um, most notably uh, in 1556, but also all the way up until 1944. But essentially, Camus analysed the human condition and how he felt people would react to being put in a situation like that and paired it with his research and actually wrote quite a, a frankly staggeringly accurate uh, account of, of what uh, he thought people would experience and what we're experiencing now. So I'd, I'd like to highlight some of those similarities and I'll start with um, rule breaking, which is something that, that's a topic on, on everyone's mind. Uh, and there are the obvious examples in, in today's society, you know, the illegal raves. Um, there was the whole uh, I think it's fair to say fiasco with uh, Dominic Cummings and whether his uh, travel was legal. Um, but one of the, the more striking comparisons I found was uh, with this character, Rambert. Now, Rambert was a journalist who'd come to the town and got trapped in the, the quarantine. And he wanted to, to return home and see his uh, girlfriend, and he enlisted the help of two smugglers uh, by names of Raul and Gonzalez to try and smuggle him out from the town using a network of tunnels. Now, one of the articles that I was reading that I, I found very similar to this was um, about a man named uh, Alan Le Bourdieu, who's the CEO of a private jet hire company, Lunar Jets. Uh, he stated that after London was put into tier four, his uh, company experienced a 250% increase in inquiries about private jet hire compared to a normal weekend in December. Now, one of the articles that I was reading was, was talking about how people would do anything to try and escape, including breaking the law. And I think Camus here really illustrates that with Rambert and the way in which he tries to essentially escape imprisonment, which is what a lot of people have been feeling lockdown is, is like. Um, so it was quite interesting that Camus, who'd never really been in a situation where he was forced to, to stay in and couldn't leave, was able to predict 
the, the extent that people go to to escape something that was essentially for their own good. I think with events, again, Camus gets its, its spot on uh, in a really, really specific way. Um, so in the novel, um, with the low cost it is um, getting forward, they try and, and build uh, two extra emergency wards, which is quite similar to the way in, in a fantastic feat of engineering, uh, the UK was able to build the Nightingale Hospital in London, the Excel Centre. But uh, one of the things that we've been seeing here today and Camus also predicted in his novel was overcrowding. To, to quote Camus, he says, en trois jours, en effet, les deux pavillons feront pli, uh, which translates as in effectively three days, the two wards were full to the brim, just full up. Um, and it just shows how it was almost predicted that uh, hospitals wouldn't be able to cope. I know we're talking about a much smaller scale in La Peste, but at the same time, we've just seen large scale lack of, of preparedness for an event such as this, and, and Camus saw that as well. Uh, you can see in the, the right hand corner, although it might be left hand corner, I'm not sure if it's flipped, uh, I've got a picture of theatres there. Um, in La Peste, uh, the plague and the quarantine lasts for a year and at one point they ease the, the restrictions, which we've also seen over the summer in the UK. And two of the characters, uh, Kota and Taru, uh, go to the theatre to uh, watch an opera, Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, and again, it pretty much follows what happened in the UK with theatres opening and people being able to go and, and watch these these plays and actually um, in compar uh, comparison to the way that there was a, a, a spike in infection rate when things began to open and theatres began to be used again uh, in the uh, showing of Orpheus and Eurydice the actor playing Orpheus actually collapses on stage again showing the, these parallels that we're seeing between what Camus thought would happen and what's actually happened. Again, the, the mental health crisis that um, Mr Trafford was talking about very briefly, um, there have been predictions that there would be a mental health crisis during lockdown when people weren't able to see other, others and, and interact as humans are, are meant to interact. And that with the lack of coping mechanisms was again referenced by Camus. He talks about um, this this issue of uh, moral comme or physique, uh, physical and moral uh, strain that is put on people and, and the way in which they have to balance what they need with what, what's best for them. So really what we have to, to think here is, is Camus has 70 years ago almost looked at what he thought would happen and now we're seeing that he was he was spot on. You know, there are there are scientists who haven't predicted this yet. He he's been able to. So I'd like to finish with what could happen in the future. Um, what if we're taking La Peste as, as our COVID playbook, so to speak? Um, what what happens? Well, uh, I'm I'm glad to report that it does get better after about a year. Um, the uh, vaccine is, is, is widespread and uh, Oran comes out of quarantine. And in the last few pages, um, Ria, one of the doctors who is also the narrator for the novel, um, reflects on the work that volunteers and what would be the equivalent of today's key workers did in order to try and stem the flow and also help those that needed it in every sense, you know, whether it's food or trying to treat people or make them comfortable when they know they're not going to survive. And I think there is a really positive message. We we do see the best of people today. You you see the, the NHS, the key workers, and people are, are putting their themselves and not seeing their families 
um, in order to try and help us. So I'd like to, to finish with a quote from Ria, uh, from Camus, if you will, um, where he says, Il y a plus de choses à admirer de que choses à mépriser, quite literally, there are more things to admire in humanity than to despise. Um, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Jan. Um, you've done a fantastic job there and um, we're very proud of you. I'll just say that just now. Um, so we do have some questions that have popped up. Um, and yeah, this is fascinating from Emily, um, who is one of our English teachers. She's asking, to what extent do you believe dystopian and absurdist work is becoming our new reality? Well, I, I think if you'd said a year and a half ago that we'd be talking online and, and live streaming events, that would seem, you know, not a, a, a reality to us. You know, this has become our new normality. So I think, yes, we do see a change in literature from as, as we adjust to what our lives are now, we will see that reflected in literature and I think dystopianism, especially with the way people have reacted to lockdowns and uh, feeling kind of compressed and harassed by the government, that will become potentially more prevalent. And I mean, I'm, I'm no expert and I wouldn't want people to imagine I am, but I could I could see them becoming more popular in, in the near future. Yeah, and on the back of that, um, another sort of literary genre question. Do you think um, we should do more exploratory scenarios um, to think about the future, to consider other possible shocks? So there's a realm of thought, you know, of futurism and future proofing our world. And um, the question is really asking you whether, you know, um, literature is a sort of vehicle to help us to prepare for the next shock, whatever that might be. I, I think it's obviously it's a very interesting thing to explore, but I think it, it's important to to notice that La Peste is one novel about one situation that has happened to, to coincide with each other. You know, there must have been thousands, hundreds of thousands of novels written about plagues and pandemics that have been completely inaccurate to what we're experiencing today. So whilst I think, yes, it's, it's, it's a great thing to explore and an idea to, to look at uh, thinking of these scenarios in the future, what the world could be like, I think it's important that we don't rely on literature as our, our means, our vehicle for exploring what the world will be like necessarily. Wise words. And um the the other question we've got here a very specific one is asking to what extent you think Camus was influenced by the Spla the Spanish flu of 1918 which of course killed millions and millions at the end of World War One yes well well Camus did his research in obviously there were a number of cases he could have looked at um, and I think the Spanish flu has to be one of the things he took into consideration, considering the the scale of the infection. And also, if you look at the comparatively, the way in which he's talked about the scale of the infection within Oran uh, in La Peste. But I think he did a lot of this. He's, he's predicted. And I think whilst he does have these uh, comparisons that he draws, I think also um, whilst he's used source material, uh, a lot of it he's, he's examined through looking at the human condition, so to speak. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, I'm just thanking you, Daniel. We've, we've come to the end of our time for questions at the moment and um, you've given a really fascinating talk and I hope lots of people will go out and read read the novel now in, in the original French, of course. <laughs> well, well done. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr Florence Weinberg, um, who will end our evening. I also want to say thank you to Florence on behalf of everyone because she worked very, very hard 
to make the technology possible for this evening and um, due credit to you, Dr Weinberg. Thank you. Thank you. That was totally your script, by the way. Anyway, I wanted to thank our four amazing speakers for agreeing to speak to us tonight. Thank you so much to everyone who's actually attended um, these fascinating talks. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, and also a huge thank you to everyone who was involved in making this event possible. Um, normally at this point of the evening, I wish you a safe journey. Um, at this point, I would say I really hope we can host you at the John Lyons School next year. And in the meantime, stay safe and thank you for joining us.